Our scripture reading this afternoon you'll find in Matthew chapter 18. It is just before the final departure of Jesus with his disciples from his home in Capernaum of Galilee in the north. Departure for Jerusalem. It'll be a journey of quite some months, but it is the final journey to Jerusalem where he will be crucified. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them and said, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe to the world for temptations to sin. For it is necessary that temptations come, but woe to the one by whom the temptation comes. And if your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than with two hands or two feet to be thrown into the eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It's better for you to enter life with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into the hell of fire. See that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine on the mountains and go in search of that one that went astray? And if he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the ninety-nine that never went astray. So it is not the will of my Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times. Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but seventy times seven. Therefore, the, law, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. 
And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, Pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me and I will pay you. He refused, and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also, my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from the heart. Let's sing in response from Psalm 30, the verses 1, 2, and 3. Oh, before we do that, I will read from Article 32 of the Belgic Confession. <clears throat> concerns what we confess concerning the order and the discipline of the church, which is also our theme from Lord's Day 31 this afternoon. We believe that although it's Useful and good for those who govern the church to establish a certain order to maintain the body of the church, they must at all times watch that they do not deviate from what Christ our only Master has commanded. Therefore, we reject all human inventions and laws introduced into the worship of God which bind and compel the consciences in any way. We accept only what is proper to preserve and promote harmony and unity and to keep all in obedience to God. To that end, discipline and excommunication ought to be exercised in agreement with the Word of God. This afternoon, it's my privilege to preach the Word of the Lord to you as that is summarized for us in Lord's Day 31 of the Heidelberg Catechism. What are the keys of the kingdom of heaven? The preaching of the holy gospel and church discipline. By these two, the kingdom of heaven is opened to believers and closed to unbelievers. How is the kingdom of heaven opened and closed by the preaching of the gospel? According to the command of Christ, the kingdom of heaven is opened when it is publicly proclaimed and testified to each and every believer that God has really forgiven all their sins for the sake of Christ's merits, as often as they, by true faith, accept the promise of the gospel. The kingdom of heaven is closed when it is proclaimed and testified to all unbelievers and hypocrites that the wrath of God and eternal condemnation rest on them as long as they do not repent. According to this testimony of the gospel, God will judge both in this life and in the life to come. How is the kingdom of heaven closed and opened by church discipline? According to the command of Christ, people who call themselves Christians but show themselves to be unchristian in doctrine or life are first repeatedly admonished in a brotherly manner. If they do not give up their errors or wickedness, they are reported to the church, that is, to the elders, 
If they do not heed also their admonitions, they are forbidden the use of the sacraments, and they are excluded by the elders from the Christian congregation and by God himself from the kingdom of Christ. They are again received as members of Christ and of the church when they promise and show real amendment. Following upon the preaching of God's word, we'll sing again from Psalm 30, the verses 4 and 5. congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Catechism talks in this Lord's Day about the opening and the closing of the kingdom of heaven. But what is that kingdom of heaven? Or as the Gospels otherwise sometimes put it, the kingdom of God. We're told by the Catechism that this kingdom is opened and closed by the use of the gospel and by discipline. They belong together. And this gospel is about the kingdom of God. You remember that from the preaching all the way back to John the Baptist. Repent, he preached, for the kingdom of God is at hand. And what he meant by that, of course, was that Jesus Christ, the king of this kingdom, was imminent. He was alive. He was about to be anointed. And he would soon ascend into heaven and take his place at the right hand of God. And he gathers his people together, the citizens of this kingdom. He's already king as he gathers together his citizens, as he fights against his enemies the devil and his minions and has promised to return on the last day when final judgment will be exercised and when that kingdom in all its fullness will be present on a renewed heaven and earth and sin once and for all banished. That's what we're talking about with entrance into this kingdom citizenship in it, that promise of eternal life with the Lord. Well, as the Catechism has said, it's the gospel, together with discipline, that open and also close this kingdom to people. They're keys, it says, two keys that function together. And they're keys that are used not by an individual. You can't excommunicate somebody mentally yourself. At least, that's not what is taught in God's Word, even though now and then individuals might try that. Just as you can't make somebody, as an individual, a member of Christ's church, just by willing it. No, the keys, the gospel, preaching, and the exercise of discipline are keys that function from the church. The Lord Jesus, after the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit descended upon the apostles, had appointed those apostles to go out into the world to establish churches by the preaching of the gospel. And everywhere they went and everywhere they established churches, what were they doing? Appointing elders who would function for these congregations of believers as shepherds, under shepherds of the great shepherd, Jesus Christ. And they shepherd the church, indeed, in Christ's name. Elders have no authority in and of themselves, not of their own, only in Christ's name. 
And by the same token, church membership is not a matter of the individual. You don't make yourself a member of Christ's church by saying, I'm a member, in the same way that you don't make yourself to be not a member anymore by saying, I'm not a member. Membership in Christ's church is determined by Christ and then through those shepherds that rule in his name, the elders, both with respect to the entry and exit of members, both, in other words, with respect to those that come in and do profession of faith, the elders oversee this process, that it is done with genuine faith, and also exit when, tragically, someone must be put out through church discipline or excommunicated, or even when somebody elects of their own accord to leave, a declaration is made by the elders that this person can no longer be considered to be a member of the congregation. Now concerning all this, this use of the two keys of the preaching of the gospel and church discipline, I want to address them this afternoon by taking a closer look at what the Lord Jesus himself teaches in Matthew chapter 18, which is why we read that chapter this afternoon. And I preach to you on that basis, God's kingdom opened and closed in humility and mercy. And we will see, firstly, that the Lord Jesus is blunt and brutal with the disciples' arrogance. Secondly, that he explains discipline as seeking the lost. And thirdly, that the Lord Jesus shows that living in God's kingdom is living out of forgiveness. God's kingdom opened and closed in humility and mercy. Well, we've read the chapter, and I said just before the reading, indeed, that the setting, the context of what is presented here in chapter 18 of Matthew is the, the last stop-off of the Lord Jesus and his disciples at Capernaum. You will have recall that in Jesus' ministry, he began in, in Galilee by preaching himself, going around the towns and villages of Galilee and preaching the gospel. But that at a certain point, uh, because of the opposition from the Pharisees from Jerusalem particularly, uh, an opposition that, that culminated in the accusation that he was only able to work miracles by the power of the devil, that Jesus stopped preaching publicly. And he trained up 12, 12 of the disciples, the young men that were following him, and he sent them to do the preaching instead of him. And they continued that, that mission of preaching in the towns and villages all in that northern region. And of the men that were following him, we get some idea of their number, when after the resurrection, Jesus appeared to them again in Galilee. And the Apostle Paul tells us that there were some 500 young men that Jesus appeared to. Well, that's about the size then of the group that were following the Lord at the time. Yet, when we in chapter 18 have a glimpse at them gathered with the Lord Jesus in Capernaum, we don't get a very good impression. These disciples have been through the training of the Lord Jesus. They've been following him. They've been listening to his preaching. They've even been allowed to go out and preach themselves. At least 12 of them have. And they've been casting out demons. They've been given the power of the Spirit, the same Spirit that the Lord Jesus was working in the Lord Jesus to cast out demons, to work miracles, to show that they were functioning in His very name. And what do we find them doing? They're bickering. They're arguing among themselves, who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom? Now, of course, they're excited about the kingdom, but they're excited in quite a wrong way. They argue, of course, that since Jesus has handpicked them, surely they will get to be the greatest. 
They'll have authority, prestige. Who's going to be the greatest? We see them tending to brush off Jesus' answers to this question as merely a, a tactic to delay the real answer. Because you see, unfortunately, this will not be the last time that the disciples argue about this point. They'll argue about it again on that way to Jerusalem. They'll even argue about it during the Last Supper. It is something that is well and truly on their minds. But the Lord Jesus is quite blunt and brutal in his response. Is he not? Verse 3. Truly, I say to you, unless you turn, or perhaps better translated, unless you turn yourselves and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Excuse me. The twelve have recently been going around the villages and towns in Galilee preaching, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. They've been inviting others to come in. And Jesus is saying to them, unless you turn yourselves around, you are never going to enter it. Now the preaching of the twelve was about opening and closing that kingdom through the message of the gospel. Remember, they were preaching, repent of your sins. Be reconciled to God. Be ready for the Messiah, the one who's been anointed to be the new king of God's people. Acknowledge him. Trust him. In other words, have faith in him. It was really just a continuation of that message of John the Baptist. And you will remember, the key point to that message was forgiveness of sins. Repent. Be reconciled with God. And the only way to be reconciled with God is to have your sins forgiven. So that God is no longer an angry judge against you as a sinful human being, but reconciled to you and welcoming to be your heavenly Father. The gospel is a gospel of reconciliation through forgiveness. Do you remember that moment almost a year before Matthew 18, when the Lord Jesus had had another gathering of people in his home. The disciples were there, several Pharisees were there too, and there were four friends that couldn't fit themselves in. They had another friend that was crippled, and they made a hole in the roof and let him down right in front of Jesus. And Jesus at that point had decided to make a point, an important point, a turning point in his preaching really, because instead of healing that cripple, which is what his friends had wanted, he saw the faith of that man, faith in him as Messiah. And he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. And that was the, what the preaching was really about. Forgiveness of sins. You know, all this healing of people that were that were crippled or lame or suffered sickness or disease, that was really just showing, showing by the power of the Spirit that this kingdom had come, that Jesus really is who He claims to be, the Son of God. And as the Son of God, somebody who is able to forgive sins. Because you see, the corollary to that is that if you're not reconciled with God, if your sins are not forgiven, 
you can't be a member of the kingdom. You can't be a citizen. And if you thought you were in, you get put out. If you're not in, you're not getting in either. We come back to the disciples there in Capernaum before the Lord Jesus. You see, their arrogance, their lack of humility is endangering even their own standing in the kingdom. It is sin. It's that same arrogance and lack of humility that hindered the Pharisees from seeing the truth. It echoes through the New Testament as a refrain. I only think of those words of the Apostle Paul in Titus 3. They're a warning. He says, As for a person who stirs up division, after warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with him, knowing that such a person is warped and sinful. He is self-condemned. But Jesus goes even further. It's not just about your sin, or in the case of the disciples, their arrogance and lack of humility. What does he say in verse 6? But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. So it's not just about my personal relationship with the Lord, that my sins are forgiven. It's also about the fact that I have a positive and not a negative impact on others around me. That I don't cause others to sin. That I don't put others in the way of temptation. Whether through my arrogance or my bad example or through aloofness, through letting somebody else stray off on his own. Because that's what Jesus then addresses next, is it not? He explains discipline as seeking the lost. I refer now to what he says in verses 10 and 11. See that you don't despise one of these little ones, says Jesus. For I tell you that in heaven, their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. And how do you get to despise one of these little ones? By letting it stray off. Because what does he do? He immediately tells that parable of the shepherd with the hundred sheep. He's got a hundred sheep. He's shepherding them on the mountains. One of them strays off. And the good shepherd, says the Lord Jesus, doesn't he abandon those 99? They're safe. They're by each other. And he goes off in search of that one lost sheep. Now, Jesus is not telling a parable about how the Lord Jesus as shepherd functions. Yes, that is how he functions. But the point of the parable is that all his disciples need to be this kind of shepherd. His disciples need to have that heart for a straying sheep. Instead of arrogantly arguing among themselves who's going to be the greatest. And so you see Jesus saying, listen, you need to go after that sheep. And he makes it even more concrete in what follows. What follows has directly to do with the practical application of that parable. If your brother sins, go tell him his fault between you and him alone. In other words, a brother sinning. And as the broader context shows us, sinning, he says, against you. In other words, sin that you know about. You go and sort it out. That brother in sin is the straying sheep. He might still physically be around you, but it's like that sheep that's gone off wandering in sin. And so Jesus says, call that sheep back. Not by blabbing around his or her sin, 
You won't call a sheep back that way. Go and speak to him alone. And what the Lord Jesus is doing is creating an environment that is the most acceptable environment for somebody to come to terms with what he's doing and to repent. If nobody else knows that he's in sin, but you, and you urge him to repent, and he repents, then nobody else ever needs to know. But if you know somebody's in sin, and you start telling other people about it, you start blabbing, or you tell that person about it mm, in the company of others, he's going to feel so shamed. You have just made it twice, if not three times, as difficult for that person to repent before the Lord. And what have you done? You have put temptation in his way. Now, what has the Lord just said about that? If you cause one of these little ones to stumble, better for you to have a millstone hang around your neck and be thrown in the sea. When we blab about other people's wrongdoings or sins, that is what we are doing. Jesus says, go to that person. Lovingly call that person back. Tug at that sheep, he says, if you really need to. In other words, if he doesn't listen to you, take one or two others as witnesses. But you're keeping it restricted. No more than is absolutely necessary. One or two others. And hopefully then he will repent. And he will know you're serious. Because it is serious, isn't it? If indeed the kingdom of heaven is closed because of unforgiven sin, then somebody that continues deliberately in sin is closing to himself that kingdom of God. And you want to bring this sheep, this person, back. And then he says, if he even doesn't listen to one or two others together with you, tell it to the church. And you've got to remember, of course, that at this time, in Capernaum there, with, with all those 500 followers, the Lord Jesus is not talking about the established church as we have after Pentecost. He's talking with that word church, which literally means the assembly. Tell it to the assembly. He's talking about the assembly of all his followers. Those 500 plus men and women that have been following him around. Tell it to the assembly. And then, because they forced your hand, everybody has to know it now. They all have a chance to remonstrate with that sheep. And only if that doesn't work, is he put out. Now, of course, at this time in Jesus' ministry, there was no possible way of Jesus saying, go and tell it to the elders of the synagogue. The elders of the synagogue, as we know from the Gospel of John, at this time, were, put, were excommunicating, putting people out of the church who confessed faith in the Lord Jesus. And so Jesus puts the onus of discipline on the assembly of his disciples. Internal. Now, of course, after Pentecost, we also take account, as the Catechism does, of the fact that the Lord Jesus, through his apostles, after Pentecost, has established local congregations of believers and had shepherds, under-shepherds, appointed over them. We call them elders. Well, the Bible calls them elders, too. And therefore, they also need to take responsibility for that task that Christ has given them. And therefore, also, they are given a place in this progression of discipline. But even they, when they have not been able to reach a sinner and bring the person to repentance, are required to tell it to the congregation. Usually that happens by means of announcements. And the person is called upon by the whole congregation to repent. And when he or she refuses to repent, 
Yes, then, says the Lord Jesus, treat him as a Gentile and a tax collector. Jesus is talking then of the sin of those that say with their mouths, oh, I believe in Jesus Christ. But in their actions and in their lifestyle, deny that profession. It's a little bit different when you have somebody that leaves the church because he says, honestly, I've got no faith. The point that Jesus is making here is of somebody that says, I've got faith, but deliberately continues to live in sin. The Apostle Paul also addresses this point in 1 Corinthians 5. He's talking to the Corinthians about that fellow who was living in sin. In fact, he was living in a relationship with his stepmother. Paul says that person knows what he's doing. He is deliberately living in sin. He needs to be put out immediately. And then Paul corrects the misunderstanding that had come upon uh, the congregation. He says, listen, I'd written to you in my letter, my previous letter, he says, uh, not to have a relationship, not to be friends with idolaters or adulterers and covetous people, that sort of person. He says, look, I didn't mean those people that don't believe. He says, I meant if anybody calls himself a Christian, but at the same time lives deliberately in sin, do not associate with that sort of person. And he's echoing the words of Jesus. Treat him as a Gentile and a tax collector. At the time, of course, Jews would have nothing to do with either group. To shame them, to show them that you cannot have profession of Jesus Christ on the one hand and a deliberate and intentional living in sin on the other. It's impossible. And Jesus says we need to take this seriously. Because if you don't, if you're pals with people that say, I believe in Jesus Christ and live their own life, Apart from Jesus Christ, you make a mockery of that profession. They need to be shown that the kingdom of heaven is closed to them until they repent. As hard as it is, that's part of taking the gospel seriously. And here again you see that Jesus, on the one hand, full of mercy and humility, when people repent and listen to the words of the gospel, on the other hand becomes blunt and, dare I say, even brutal, when there is refusal to bow the knee before the Lord. For the stakes are high. Think only of what he says in verses 19 and 20. Again I say to you, he says, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, and this is still in the context of this discipline, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. Literally, it shall have been done by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. That brings us to the final point this afternoon. Jesus shows that living in God's kingdom is living out of forgiveness. I've said already that belonging to this Kingdom of heaven is being reconciled to God. Well, being reconciled to God is having your sins forgiven through the blood of Jesus Christ, acting upon that. In other words, living a life of thankfulness to Him, a life that shows true repentance from sin. 
And this is what Jesus also emphasizes in what follows. Peter asks him, how often should I forgive someone? Seven times? Seventy times seven, says Jesus. What is true forgiveness? And he tells that parable, he says, it's like a king, and this king is explicitly compared to the Lord God himself. This king has a servant. This servant owes him 10,000 talents. Now, that is a fortune. Like, that is the tax revenue of an entire country for a year in those days. And the king demands his money back. And the servant cannot possibly pay. He pleads with him. He gets down on his knees. And the Lord sees that humble spirit. And that plea for forgiveness. And he grants him not just time to pay the debt. He grants him complete forgiveness of that whole debt. But what happens? That very same servant goes out and he's got another servant. He owes a considerable amount of money in normal everyday affairs, but nothing like the fortune that he's just been forgiven of. And you get the same scenario. Because that second servant gets down on his knees and pleads with the other servant, give me time, I will pay. He shows humility. But this servant, the one that's been forgiven the fortune, grabs him and demands payment, throws him in prison until the debt's been repaid. Well, how long is that going to take? If you're in prison, you're relying entirely on other people to round up that money for you. But this gets back to the king. And remember, the king is representing the Lord God himself. What does God turn around and say? <laughs> Servant number one, you, by your actions, have just made your forgiveness null and void. And into prison he goes. It's not enough. It's not enough just to ask the Lord humbly for forgiveness of our sins and then to think, great, I've got forgiveness. Go off and lead your life. It's living out of that forgiveness. Showing that you understand what it amounts to as you interact with others, with brothers and sisters who also need forgiveness. For all of us, all of us are sinners that need to repent and that have to show humility individually before God, minister and elders, no exception, and then understand what God has given us in Jesus Christ in the way that we deal with our fellow brothers and sisters. That's living out of the gospel. It brings it back to its very essence. And as Jesus shows in this passage, he then expects us all, in a way, to be little under-shepherds ourselves. He is our great shepherd. But if he's mediated for us and granted forgiveness and reconciliation with his heavenly Father, he expects us to show what that means by looking out for those around us, by making sure that none of us are straying away. And instead of putting stumbling blocks in their way, doing the reverse, calling them back. And when you put it that way, you can see that preaching the gospel and church discipline they're not things that you leave to the consistory. Discipling others around us, dealing with discipline in terms of getting people to repent from their sin is something that Jesus expects from each and every one of us. And let us in humility 
and in the love of Christ, take up that task. Because then we can sit with each other around the Lord's Supper table, knowing that we're reconciled with God, that Christ has paid for our sins, and that, sure, with stumbling and falling, yet nevertheless, we in faith are attempting to show God that life of thankfulness for what He has done for us and sealed for us in the blood of Christ. Praised be His name. Amen.